Okay, uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Juan Enrique Martinez Legaz, uh, who is an usual uh, guest in our seminars. And uh, Professor Martinez Legaz is an expert in uh, mathematical economics, uh, in, in convexity, in conjugates, and uh, has more than 100 uh, papers. Uh, last time I saw 118, but uh, they are uh, a lot of them, of course, and 431 sites by uh, 230 authors. So it's a big uh, uh, repercussion. So uh, it's uh, our pleasure to have you here, and uh, we are your public. So. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Juan and Lola, for inviting me uh, to this nice workshop and for your warm hospitality, which I have already enjoyed uh, several times. It's always a pleasure to be here and also a good opportunity to meet uh, other good friends. And I'm also happy this time to give this talk in front of uh, our colleagues from uh, Vietnam and very happy to see that um, the collaboration which started uh, by uh, Marco and Miguel Angel with Professor Dean is now growing and becoming more uh, formal with this agreement. But um, I want to claim priority in the Spanish-Vietnamese uh, cooperation because um, I think in mathematics, at least, the first Spanish-Vietnamese cooperation was when uh, Professor Dean Teluk visit, spent one year in my department as teaching in Spanish in, in 1991, I think. Later, in 1995, Professor Fang Husak spent a sabbatical semester in my university and probably the oldest uh, Vietnamese-Spanish uh, joint papers in mathematics I had my papers with uh, Luke and later with uh, Sachs. So and I'm, I'm very proud of this cooperation. This is why I want to claim priority because... Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, because I, I really admire very much uh, Vietnam, its people and its mathematicians. Okay, and also um, I think I have chosen a very appropriate topic for this workshop for two reasons. Once because it is a joint work with Abderrahim Hantut, who spent uh, several years in, in Alicante, and also because very indirectly, but this paper, which by the way is already online in the Journal of Optimization Theory and Applications, has its origin in, in Vietnam, somehow indirectly. So I can tell you the story of, of, of this paper. Um, almost five years ago, in one of my visits in Taiwan, Nicolas Hatsisabas uh, told me that uh, a Vietnamese colleague, I'm sure you know him, Professor Yen, Yen from, uh, from the Hanoi Institute of Mathematics, was teaching uh, a master course there. And he gave to the students an exercise, namely to prove that if two convex functions have the same subdifferential everywhere, they coincide up to an additive constant. Very tough exercise to me, at least. But there was a very brilliant uh, Czech student, Pavel Kocurek, who came with a very elementary and elegant solution to the problem. And in fact, uh, what uh, Abderrahim and I have done in this work is to exploit his technique. So, I hope you will like the talk. If you don't like it, it's my fault, the presentation was not good. If, if, if you like it, it's because of the brilliant proof of Kotsurek. Um, so, I will just present one result, or one result and a corollary, and I will give the proof. Because in the proof, you will see the elegance, the beauty of the technique invented by Kotsurek. Um, the talk is about Lipschitz DC functions, but uh, Lipschitz will only appear in the, in the corollary. So in the main result will be stated in more general 
uh, terms. Um, the setting is the following. We consider a Banach space X. Then we consider two functions on X, extended real value. The only assumption we made on these functions it, is that they have a common domain and this common domain is a convex set. Let's call it D. So D, but definition is the domain of F, which coincides with the domain of G, and we assume that this set is convex. And the result will be expressed in terms of another function, H, uh, finite value, which will be assumed to be convex, continuous, and vanishing at the origin. Um, okay, this is the setting. And then, under these assumptions, I'm going to state the equivalence uh, among five different statements. In the corollary, that will be seven. But in the general uh, result, there are five. So the following statements are equivalent. Statement one, F and G are convex, lower semi-continuous on D, and the following inequality holds true. F of X um, minus g of x is less than or equal to f of y minus g of y plus h of x minus y for every x, y in d. Statement 2 is um, for every x in d and for every strictly positive epsilon one has that the epsilon subdifferential of f at x is non-empty and is contained in the epsilon subdifferential of g at x plus the epsilon subdifferential of h at the origin. Uh, third, for every x in d and for every Excuse me, there exists some positive delta such that for every epsilon smaller than delta, one has uh, this uh, condition. This inclusion together with the non emptiness of the first set. The fourth condition is for every x in D. Um, and for every strictly positive epsilon, one has that the following intersection is non-empty. Is the intersection of these two sets. And statement number five is uh, like 3 is obtained from 2. For every x in D, there exists delta depending on x such that for every epsilon between 0 and delta, one has this condition. So, this is the main result, the equivalence between these five statements. And the interesting thing is not the result, it's the proof. Well, uh, to prove the equivalence, there are some implications which are completely obvious. Namely, uh, 2 implies 3 implies 5 and 2 implies 4 implies 5. They are obvious. 2 implies 3 
And uh, four in place five, because uh, we are saying for every epsilon and then for every sufficiently small epsilon. And uh, three in place five and two in place four, because so we are saying that one star implies two stars, which is obvious because if we have this inclusion, this intersection is the smallest, the smallest set, which is non-empty. So this is obvious. So to finish the proof, we only need to prove one implies two and five implies one. And one implies two, we will see, is an easy exercise. And five implies two is also an easy exercise thanks to Kotsourek. Okay. Um, so one implies two comes from the following observation. So we consider given x in D and epsilon, positive number, and uh, then I'm going to compare the function f with the function g plus f of x minus g of x plus this function. x is given. x is given. So I am going to prove this uh, condition for every x and every epsilon, so epsilon and x are given. And this is the x I'm considering here, so this is a constant. We have this inequality because of assumption 1. Uh, interchange the roles of x and y here. You have to interchange the, the roles of x and y. And then what happens with this inequality at x? That it becomes equality because h vanishes at the origin. Then, because of these two uh, relations, we have that the epsilon subdifferential of the smaller function is contained in the epsilon subdifferential of the larger function at the point where they coincide. So, we have this contained in the epsilon subdifferential of g plus h. I am at h, at x. I am omitting this term because it is just a constant. It doesn't affect the subdifferential. And then we can apply a well-known formula for the epsilon subdifferential of a sum, which says that it is the union over epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 non-negative such that epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 is equal to epsilon of the epsilon 1 subdifferential of g at x plus the epsilon 2 subdifferential of this function at x, but this is the same as the epsilon 2 subdifferential of h at the origin. And then because epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 are smaller than or equal to epsilon, this is contained in the epsilon subdifferential of g at x plus epsilon plus the epsilon subdifferential of h at the origin. Uh, so as you see, and as I said, it's an easy, an easy exercise to prove one implies two. So now it comes the interesting part of the talk where I will use the technique by Kotsourek to prove that uh, five implies one. So I have to prove one, and in fact, the fact that um, f and g are convex and lower semi-continuous on d is immediate because of the non-emptiness of the epsilon subdifferential for every sufficiently small epsilon. This is well known; nothing new on this. So the only thing which remains to be proved is this inequality. Okay, so to prove this inequality, I uh, take x and y in D, and I will prove the inequality. Uh, to the same, I take any epsilon 
smaller than delta, so we, we are starting with a statement 5, so there is some delta given, and I take e epsilon smaller than delta. And then uh, I take u star in the epsilon subdifferential of f at x, I take v star in the epsilon subdifferential of g at y, this is possible because of the non-emptiness assumptions here. And we need to be something slightly more sophisticated. Now it comes Kotzorek idea. Uh, so this is x, this is y, and so I am go going to divide this segment into n equal parts. x m1, x M, M minus 1, okay? So these are subsegments of the same length. So what I'm doing is I'm uh, taken, taking M, 2, 3, etc. And then I define X, MI equal to X plus I over M times Y minus X. i from 1 to m minus 1. And then, now it is the time to exploit condition uh, 2 stars. So, because of this assumption, but first, which is the epsilon I'm going to consider here, not that epsilon. I have to modify it. I need, I will make it depending on m. Let's say I will take eta sub m between 0 and delta, uh, to be able to apply condition 5. Okay, and then uh, as we will see uh, later, we need to take it uh, small enough, not just smaller than delta, but we will see later. Um, and so I will take u star mi in, in this intersection, okay, but with eta m at this point. So this point not only belongs to this set but also to the second set, which means that there exists some element in the second set with eta m in place of epsilon and x m i instead of x. I will call this element v star m i in the eta m subdifferential of g of x m i and so that the difference u star m i minus v star m i is here but with eta m belongs in the eta m subdifferential of h at the origin and this we do for every i from 1 to m minus 1. And now it's just a matter of writing the subgradient inequality. Uh, many of them to make a simple operation and to see the conclusion. That's the whole idea by Kotzurek. Uh, very easy once you have seen it. I should not have deleted the picture. So this is x, this is y, this is x m1, this is x m m minus 1, etc. No? X m okay, no need to. In general we have x m i. So first of all, because of this, I can write that f of x m1 minus f of x is greater than or equal to 1 over m y minus x u star minus epsilon. 
this is the duality product. Okay? Used the value of u star at y minus x. Now, in this interval, the same I have done in this interval, I will do in this more general interval using u star mi. So I can write that f of x m i plus 1 minus f of x m i is greater than or equal to 1 over m 1 minus x because this difference is the same uh, times u star m i minus eta m for i for 1 to m minus 1. And now the interesting idea of uh, Koturek. For the other function g, I will do the same but in the opposite direction, starting with y. So, because of this, well, first because of this, I will write that uh, g of x m m minus 1 minus g of y is greater than or equal to minus 1 over n 1 minus x v star m i minus eta m for the same values of y uh, sorry there is no mm, 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 this is not correct this is v star and this is epsilon okay i am too fast okay so this is what and now it comes the more general g x m m minus i i am doing it backwards now moving in this direction minus g of x excuse me i plus one and this is i is greater than or equal to minus one over m y minus x v star m i minus eta m for the same values of i. I'm almost finished. Now I only have to add all these relationships. And we have a telescopic sums here. So after simplification, what do we get? We get, so the last one here, which is f of y, because it corresponds to, um, I should have written that if I write here from 0 to m, then this means that x m0 is equal to x independent of m and x m m is equal to y independent of m. Okay? So now, uh, so this telescopic sum is simply f of y minus f of x. Similarly, this other sum is g of x minus g of y and then on the right hand side I get okay first I will add these two terms so this is 1 over m y minus x we u star minus v star minus 2 this and this I am adding uh, okay um, this and this minus 2 epsilon now I'm going to add the remaining terms. So I get plus sum over i from 1 to m minus 1 of 1 over m uh, y minus x u star this and this eh? u star m i minus v star mi minus twice m minus 1 eta m okay this is what I have got but look this difference is in this uh, approximate subdifferential which means each of these terms is less than or equal to minus h of x minus y uh, minus 
eta m. Okay, using the Sapridian inequality again. Minus or plus. Um, I don't want to make mistakes. A plus. Okay, plus. And you are using the h of zero is zero. Exactly. We are using that h of zero is zero. Yeah. Uh, and now, okay, I told you that we have to be careful with the choice of eta m. So we need this to go to zero as m goes to infinity. So for instance, take this equal to delta divided by m squared. So you will have all these uh, conditions. And then, so if you look at here, what happens? So we get these two terms, 1 over m, y minus x star, u star minus v star, and here we have got m minus 1 over m times this term. Uh, minus this term. Okay, and now because of the choice of eta m, this goes to zero, as m goes to infinity, uh, this two. Okay, so we are left with, uh, and this two. So we are left with what? Uh, this left hand side, uh, f of y minus f of x plus g of x minus g of y less than or equal to minus h of x minus y minus 2 epsilon but epsilon was arbitrarily small so we can remove this term and we are done this was the inequality uh, so if you like this thank to Kocourek because it was his idea which we have exploited in a more general context or indirectly thanks to Professor Yen who suggested this exercise to uh, Kotsourek. And um, okay, now, but I didn't uh, mention the Lipschitz condition, not the DC condition. DC means difference of convex functions. So now, if you want to obtain the, the result about the Lipschitz character of uh, of a DC function, simply make this choice for the function h. So k is a non-negative number, the Lipschitz constant. You can admit k be, to be equal to zero, then being a, a zero Lipschitz function means being a constant. Okay? So, but this particular case can be considered. And then given h, define Given this k, define h as k times the norm. Uh, then, with this choice, condition 1, you can look at the inequality, means exactly that this difference, this dc function, the restriction of f to d minus the restriction of g to d is k ellipses. And then in statements 2, 3, 4 and 5 you can rewrite them taking into account that for this particular choice of h the epsilon sub differential at the origin is the ball in the dual space with center at the origin and radius k. Okay? So, for instance, just as an example, uh, condition 2 reads the epsilon subdifferential of f at x is non empty and is contained in the epsilon subdifferential of g at x plus the ball. And you can do the same replacement in the other statements. 
Then there is something interesting to, to notice, namely that in some statements it's obvious, in some others it's not. Um, condition one is symmetric with respect to f and g. If you interchange f and g, nothing changes. But this is not the case in statement two. But because it is equivalent to statement one, it, uh, as a conclusion, we have that you can also interchange g and f here. This inclusion, as it is written, in particular implies that the Hausdorff excess is smaller than k, smaller than or equal to k. It, it implies. But then, because of the symmetry, the other Hausdorff excess is also less than or equal to k. So, this implies 6, namely the Hausdorff distance between the epsilon subdifferential of f and the epsilon subdifferential of g is less than or equal to k for every x and every epsilon positive, sufficiently small, etc. And, of course, 6 implies 7. 7 is with the ordinary distance because the distance is smaller than the Hausdorff distance. Okay? So you have the distance is less than or equal to k for every x and every epsilon positive. But in fact, also 7 implies 1. Why? Because if this distance is smaller than k, you cannot you cannot uh, write, um, let's say, condition 5 with, uh, with the ball of radius k because maybe the distance is not attained. But if you consider an arbitrarily larger k prime, then it holds. So the conclusion is that for every k prime strictly greater than k, the function is k prime Lipschitz, but then it is k Lipschitz. So in fact, you have equivalences. Okay. So, if you want just to remember one equivalence, the strongest one, apparently, is that the DC function is k Lipschitz if and only if the distance between the epsilon subdifferentials at every point and for every epsilon sufficiently small is uh, less than or equal to, to k. And in particular, you can consider k equal to zero. Then we are saying the two functions are the same up to an additive constant if and only if uh, the distance between the subdifer epsilon subdifferentials is zero for every x and every epsilon. So, well, this is the, the result and I hope you like the technique by Kocurek. By the way, his proof was published upon invitation in the journal Optimization uh, in 2010 maybe. Um, I'm not sure. That's all. Thank you. Uh, you presented something related to this, not exactly this, uh, concerning this uh, result of Kukulek. And uh, Lionel Thibault a little bit uh, critical in the sense that there was some thing beyond the proof, that makes the proof not so simple. I, I don't remember exactly which was the, the, the okay. meaning of the result. Um, it's a joint paper with uh, Regina Buracic and Marco Rocco, in which uh, we also exploit the same idea. And it was at your workshop here in Elche uh, two years or three years ago and three years ago. And uh, I started the presentation by emphasizing the beauty, the elementarity, the elegance of the proof by Kocourek, like I have done today. But also uh, emphasizing the fact that I think it's not very easy to get an elementary proof of the classical result. If you look at the book by Rockefeller, you have to rely on several previous results, etc. And Lionel said that, no, you can do elementary things, but I, I, I disagreed, because these elementary things, re value, uh, mean value for instance, and other things. So, I mean, if you accept, but this proof, you can tell to a very uh, young student with almost no knowledge of anything. 
And I think you can also apply the same idea in other situations. It's very original, his proof. But his proof is not a problem. Namely, uh, his proof requires non-emptiness of the subdifferential everywhere. So even if you are in Rn, you have problems in the relative boundary of the domain. Uh, here, thanks to the use of epsilon subdifferentials, we avoid, we have no problem. <laughs> It is essential that the parts are equal. You see, if in this group, yes. In this, uh, but what, what do you mean? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, the paper by Kotsourek uh, was, of course, sent to a referee who made a very good report. But that referee observed that. I mean, he didn't emphasize the, that the, the merit of the paper was in the elementarity of the proof, but he was paying more attention to the fact that in his result, he observes that it's enough to have an unempty intersection of the subdifferentials. Not equality, just to have a common point. Okay, but the referee said, um, well, this is an exercise, because if you have just a common point, a common subdifferential at every point, then in finite dimensions, because the function is differentiable almost everywhere, at the points where there is a gradient, you have equality. A common element means coincidence. And then, because at the other points, you can recover the subdifferential by taking limits of the gradients, then you are done. Of course, so this is an exercise, but the interest was in the technique, not in the refinement of the result. So uh, we decided to publish the paper in spite of the. No, the, the referee didn't say it should not be published, but just was not as enthusiastic as I am with uh, Kotsourek uh, proof. Other comment? Okay. No? So, uh, thank you again.